I, I, I think this is like something that uh, any Singapore kid at that time going to a government school would have that rule if he or she is lucky enough uh, or bright enough to work past your PSLE and then they rank you and you, right, if you happen to be the top 200 or 100, you get into a very good school like Raffles. And then you just go there and then you do like Raffles, you kind of you jump into you that you got to do well and then you, you, you do your your O levels, you make sure you get as many distinctions as possible <laughs> and the A levels, and then that comes the scholarship. Okay. And it's, a, it's a very well trodden path by, by a small group of people. Now this is what I need. There's that word again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So, so the thing is, uh, you are you are a shiny example of the meritocratic Singapore that we've come to know. Well, if in a way it can be put like that, but I would say later on in my career, you know, uh, I certainly. A lot of my peers, uh, uh, people who are not doing well, doing, doing very well, like chief editor of the Straits Times, like public secretaries and so on, I think they would look at me and don't think of me as being very meritocratic or <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but but I, I would say that uh, um, going through the civil service and then through the Straits Times later and through equity, that, uh, yeah, and, um, that it, in a way, one, you're kind of like assessed on your ability up to a point, certain appointments like the Straits Times, to, to go to a certain level, you have to be politically correct. Okay. And I was, not, not that I was right now, talented enough to get to those heights, but I was also politically correct. So, from those humble beginnings, you know, you found your way to New Zealand. How yeah. did that happen? Well, you know, I, I, by the time I reached my, my levels, HSC, uh, I kind of said I must get out of this. You know, uh, and the only way I could get out was to get a scholarship and apply for it. There was two, I have two options given to me, and to this day, I kind of sometimes regret not taking the other option. First option, to learn Russian language at Oxford. Mm -hmm. Second option is psychology in New Zealand. Um, I kind of, you know, at that time they were practical Singaporean. I thought, well, how do I learn in Russian? And the parents also were kind of in Russian. So you kind of think, out of psychology in New Zealand from there. there. But no regrets. I, I think New Zealand certainly doesn't give me the kind of, uh, the, the kind of um, prestige. Uh, as well. so, <clears throat> but I think New Zealand taught me many things that I would never have learned if I come to England. New Zealand taught me what the real true egalitarian society was like. New Zealand was very egalitarian. And I think my sense of activism later on is really began in New Zealand. <clears throat> if any of you have read a recent biography on Chan Si Tong, he also went to New Zealand. He's credited his New Zealand experience with making him uh, what he is. Uh, wanting to be an opposition politician in his parents. So, New Zealand <laughs> is where it all happens. Um, so, tell, tell us more about your New Zealand days, you know, uh, how that uh, hmm, okay. shaped you. Yeah, I, actually, um, um, before I went to New Zealand, uh, in my high school year, that was when I started to develop a liking for theatre, you had, of course, your school productions. Then I remember going to see I suppose, a, a first kind of semi-professional production by the stage club. Then it was kind of like only get a coming. And we bring passage to India. And I remember, wow, I'm kind of very really impressed with it because this you hear more actors speaking the language in a very natural accent. And, but uh, when I went to New Zealand, <coughs> that's when I was able to see more theatre. Mind you, I mean, it wasn't a great theatre scene, but at least in Wellington, there were professional theatre companies that would do something, you can watch something every night of the year, you can go to professional team. And, and in a way, I value that. Uh, I, I value some very creative things, I saw like that. My first week arriving in New Zealand, <coughs> my university had a play by the university drama company, we were doing Macbeth. And I went, and of course, way back in Raffles, we also did Macbeth. And I saw the difference between the standards, you know, I was so impressed with the guy who played Macbeth. 
uh, second year student. And of course, the, the name of the guy, Sandy. <laughs> Sandy. <laughs> Later, he became uh, a very famous actor. But yeah, so, so in a way, New Zealand was important for me as a, a person um, getting an education, learning a society. It was kind of like my formative years, uh, gaining an interest in theatre and seeing good professional theatre. And, and this scholarship was uh, which scholarship? At that time, there was something called the Colom Colombo Colom 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 yeah. Which uh, Singapore then was kind of third world, third country. So rich countries like New Zealand, Australia, but they passed this scholarship. Yeah. So yeah, and I did the degree in psychology, so I never did this scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> but not even in your place. But let's face it, how many of you uh, use your first degree to earn a living? Probably not many, right? <laughs> We have we have some young impressionable <laughs> minds here. Okay, <laughs> so let's not discourage them. <laughs> okay, so so uh, so so those were your formative years, and then of course uh, you uh, had to do this thing which uh, many Singaporeans uh, cannot run away from. Yeah, national service came after university. University. I think now it's the reverse. So you have to do it first before you go to university. In those days, ah, that's, ah, I'm the, I'm the meritocratic right? If you get a scholarship to go overseas, you're excused from that for a while, and then you're a university first and come back and do your NS. Yeah. Tell us about your NS days. Um, because, I, because I went to New Zealand and come back, I of course missed the, 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 the local NUS TV, we all bunch together and then go to OCS and become officer. When I came back, I had to drive what we call the Hawkeye the Two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was not good. I mean, uh, I have having friends that I really enjoyed the experience. So, so to, I, I understand why some people look at national service and say it was such a such a dread, such a chore. And there was a bit of it before you went in, but after a while, time flew, and, and I really look at those years um, not to any bad memories or any sense of dread. It was okay. And some of us were really fun. Yeah. And the friendships were made. So, would you say you identify with uh, the things that are portrayed in Army Days? Mm. By another playwright? <laughs> By the channel? Kind of it. I didn't have, there was no platoon mate who was going to migrate to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that was, but it was, <laughs> it didn't generate the kind of, of drama that we saw in Army Days. So, so NS was good for you. NS was okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. but I, I don't think there was anything in my NS experience that that kind of like uh, contributed to me as a theatre person. Mm -hmm. But there, there, there's another side uh, to Russell, which uh, perhaps uh, you may not have seen, and so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> This was, um, I, I came back, national service, um, started working, and in those days, maybe it's not common now, but in those days it's kind of like not common to move out and live on your own. I really had to, after, after living overseas, you're just so independent. So a friend, a friend of mine uh, and I shared an HDB flat. Uh, I'm not supposed to, right? <laughs> uh, but his, his, his mother owned it, like he needed so we kind of use that issue. So of course when you have your own private space, you let your friends come around and you can, you can goof around like that and do things like that. Yes. So was this very unusual in those days? Uh, that you know you know young people would go and rent private, you know. It was unusual. But partly because I think it's not cheap to do it. Uh, and housing was not so easily available. Uh, and I think mostly for the psychological psychological things. Just not expected of you to move out till you are married. Mm -hmm. So you, you basically have to fight certain battles at home and be brave enough to tell your parents, I'm going to do it. What did your parents say? I think having people overseas help. They kind of accepted that this is something you do. You, you, you learn overseas, so you have to do it. But, but there's a price to pay for that. I have to work every day, I go home at dinner first. 
So he, you, you understood the art of the compromise. Mm. Well, I suppose once. I mean, everybody has to have met for it. Uh, but what, was this the reason why you had to move out? <laughs> no. Ah, no, no. This is not less the <laughs> When you have somebody who needs to live away from home. Uh, I wasn't learning a living on Buddhist street. <laughs> I wasn't pretty. <laughs> uh, um, no, no. I mean, I had a time of civil servant and then uh, other friends, so we decided to, to, to just go for our and take pictures. That, um, yeah. You were a civil servant who liked dressing up. Mm -hmm. uh, I often didn't show this to my civil servant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. But, uh, but so seriously, uh, so is this a part of your, of you, of Russell Hing, that? Uh... I kind of believe. Some of you may not agree that every one of us met that is a drag queen. That given the right circumstances, people come up. I remember being on a cruise ship when I was in New Zealand, and on that ship was like I was the only Asian guy. The rest were Australian and New Zealanders. And then of course on the, on the cruising ship you have some kind of like a, a fun evening where it's a, it's a masquerade, you, you don't dress up. And, and I kind of find very strange that basically 90% of the New Zealand and Australian men turn out that night all decide to drag. It's like the idea of dressing up must be mm. to drag. <laughs> Not that a very macho country where rugby players and farmers and all that. Yeah, it just leads me to think that it doesn't take a lot to take out of every one of us. <laughs> that, that, mm, when once we colourful, um, some of we're looking at all the men in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course, some of the, the little snippets in less I suppose you can say I drew from that part of my life when I was starting to have friends who, who were gay. Uh, friends actually work on Buddhist street as sex workers. And and would you say that was your first introduction to uh, drag? Being on that ship and seeing? No, um, actually, when I was a kid, um, I was a good boy. My other brother was almost a small team boy and played good boys. I stayed home. And of course, my sister's dressing up. <laughs> 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 okay. So, so you were saying that uh, from, from these uh, early encounters, it led to some parts of uh, less achievements. Yeah, well, uh, some parts of it. I, I believe a lot of us like in plays uh, kind of usually draw from your, like, your private experience mm -hmm. and your experience of your friend. And, and so that leads us to, uh, you know, uh, some, some, some more early day pictures. Tell us about this one. 75, the year I started working, have started to come. My first car, um, guess the price, $6,700. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's the mother. Uh, by the time we have kind of a lot of queens now, the HDB into, into what you could say called condo, uh, not sea low. Yeah, so, um, yeah. And then uh, we have another picture of you as well. Uh, uh, this is the old national theater. Uh, yeah, um, um, that's where I I watch a lot of things that uh, and yeah and, and uh, some some of the things I watch that I uh, would be Joshua. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one of my 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 love of yeah, go to Joshua and my little So was it the mom who introduced you to Joshua? Well, I'm Tia Chu, so you kind of grew up in Chinatown, the Red Fusion would be blaring Tia Chu Opera every day. You grew up just a uh, certain family different. I think my generation is the last dialect speaking generation, so you could understand quite a lot of it. And uh, so for, let me see, who's. Yes, I think there are some young ones in the, in the house tonight who may not recognize uh, you know, the National Theatre. Uh, uh, it's actually also the young court, you know. Uh, so, so in those days, it really was the National. It was the Esplanade yes. of, no, of the day, of the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah of the day. Right. Yeah. Um, so, alright, let's uh, move on. Yeah. Um, then you went away again. Uh, 77 to 78. I was at the School of Oriental and African Studies, mm -hmm. 
I was doing some Asian studies, I was learning the Vietnamese language. Um, and then uh, my year in London, London is very different from New Zealand. New Zealand, I suppose you say, is kind of provincial. <laughs> London is a big metropolis. And, um, and part of the reason that I decided to do that in London was because I realized that London was like the capital of the English speaking theater. People like, just see heat and heat. So that, that shot, that one year in London, I really did theater very right, intensively. Um, and of course, the other crazy things. But I would, I would again credit that year in London with, with teaching me a lot about theater. So, so as is opposite brother on Butch Street. And you could get to see productions by graduating students, very cheap, uh, and usually very well done. Uh, so I actually watched this. And what, uh, sorry, I just want to, uh, crazy things. Uh, okay, uh, by that time, as a young gay person, uh, Living away from Singapore, where the gay scene really was very limited. London, there's so many things to do, and we started to have um, lovers of white friends. So, yeah. so, so that's what we Okay, alright. So then, uh, so once again, you went away on scholarship. Yes. Uh, uh, generosity of Singapore government. <laughs> I, as part of my first scholarship form, like I, I had four years in this came back. Uh, I set my eight year board out at the Ministry of Defense where I was a researcher. I was at the Security and Intelligence Department, SIG, which, which I suppose to make simple for those of you who don't know what this is, it is the equivalent of the American CIA. This would be Singapore's security agency that watch other countries. So, which is different from ISC, which watch Singapore, it's in Singapore, that's, that would be yeah. So, um, it was, it was there that I was told, well, okay, we'll put you in the Indochina desk. So, and so, in, and I was never offered that one year just go to London, uh, learn to be an expert in Southeast Asian history, learn the Vietnamese language, you can't learn it in the second Okay. And then you came back? Yes, I came back. And then? Then you came back. Well, uh, in 80, I left the civil service to begin my life as a journalist. Uh, uh, and I, I, as a journalist, I got to become the features editor of Sunday Times. And in the features editor of Sunday Times, you have pages, fashion, food, and all that. And you know, I very much sought after my PR. And I suppose those years, I would say that I was a lifestyle queen. I had to live in a nice apartment, decided. Inside <laughs> the furniture that would get itself into home and decor magazine. Mm -hmm. um, just a bit. Uh, the one of the one of the reasons why I made a jump from civil service uh, to newspaper world. I was actually quite good at what I was doing in the civil service. Uh, uh, it also was quite interesting, uh, very interesting in, in intelligence service. But I had to leave because after the uh, after, after quite a few years working there, you know, as, as you work in, in security intelligence, uh, you need to get security theories at you know, a very high level because you're really classified. It. And then that one year came when they just wouldn't give me that security theory because I was gay. Mm -hmm. So it was time to part. Do they not know you were? I don't know whether they know or not. Or oh, I could be that they chose not to make an issue of it like you. It's quite easy. Yes. Maybe it's because I grew in seniority and was starting to do more and more, more and more uh, sensitive stuff. Mm -hmm. So, so it's came that path and started. Which then uh, leads us, of course, uh, when you were in the newspapers, you you wrote this your first play. Yeah. Uh, actually, um, the the script for Lesson Demons was complete. 